When we bought our farm in northern Portugal, we had no set vision for what we would create here. This is amazing. We didn't even know if we'd have a permanent future here. Two and a bit years later, here we are, with a request submitted to our local authorities to build our forever oh, home. So it is a dream come true, and we document it with twice weekly episodes on this channel. Morning, so make sure you're subscribed if you're not already. We've had some disappointing news on our permission application. Sadly, our first round of application and planning permission has been rejected. And have faced some serious challenges over the past few weeks here on our farm. Oh, shit. That have us thinking about everything that needs to be considered if you're looking to buy abandoned land in Portugal. Sure, there is a lot of sunshine and rainbows, but when the going gets tough, well, it's not easy. What? John? So in this episode, we wanted to talk about why buying a dream homestead in Portugal might not be the best idea for everyone. How are you doing? I definitely do. We're nearly at double speed, but we just keep holding that tight, okay? Yeah. Can I get the paper cut? Could I have fixed it with the plaster? Is all this drama really necessary? Yeah, I think it's necessary. Like I haven't done my hair for the camera. <laughs> uh, do you know what's happening at the moment is that I'm sweating and the salt from my sweat is going in my cut and that's the most painful thing at the moment. Quite a lot of salt being rubbed into wounds in this episode. Stick around, you'll see what I mean. What were you um, cutting? So it wasn't that I was cutting, I was I, I just moved my hand out of the way. Ugh, I can't talk. Okay. Yeah. Tell us about it afterwards, shall I? And I moved my hand across one and it sliced it open. Yeah. I think, oh, anyway, I, I briefly had a look at it and then I was like, oh dear, that, that looks horrible. And then I started squeezing my hand together like I'm doing now. You've um, managed to get us all the way to the hospital without a drop of blood coming up, which yeah, is yeah. quite impressive. It might not be anything. There's the hospital. <laughs> There's the hospital. We've made it. Right, let's get you in there. <laughs> I don't know. Look, 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 let's look, look, check. look. If I let go of it, it's going to pop open. Okay, don't. No, don't. <laughs> Look at okay. that. Look. Oh. oh, gosh. Make me feel oh, ill. I feel sick. You okay? Mm, it's it's fresh. fresh. It's uh, cold. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Don't try to I'm laughing. It's not, it's not laughing at you. It's just nervous laughing. I'm being a real big baby. Huh? No, you're not. You haven't cut through any nerves or big veins or anything like that. Yeah, I know. So that's good news. Yeah, it is. Just need stitches though. Yeah, I do. I gotta, I gotta just step out for a second, okay? Please, can our boys never get into this kind of situation? I'm gonna be rubbish. Oh, you know that they're gonna. <laughs> I know. Between the two of us, we're gonna be dreadful. How does it look? That'd be a good scar. Hunter S. Thompson, wasn't it? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six. Six, six stitches. Six. It was pretty stressful. <laughs> <laughs> what a difference 15 or 20 minutes makes. Literally, I couldn't stand up going in there. Now I feel totally fine. Wow. That Isn't was that amazing. amazing. We literally arrived straight in, straight to be seen. I know it doesn't always happen like this in Portugal, but we are really grateful. The sweat starts to dry, yeah. the hands fixed. It's been a pretty stressful morning and well, I think I've got to make it up to Tara a little bit. So I've put on my glad rags and I'm going to take her out for some lunch. My glad rags are of course from True Classic. Those guys don't just make t-shirts and as you can see, they make fancy shirts, lovely trousers, they even make socks and underwear too all of which follows in line for those t-shirts that you've probably already bought. I know a lot of you guys did go out and buy some True Classic tees. Very soft, great fitting, and extremely comfortable to wear. It's true. Tara also tells me that I look pretty good in them too. <whistles> Not very often you guys get to see me in anything except for a True Classic t-shirt and a pair of jeans. So, savour the moment. Whoa. Everybody, <laughs> enjoy Whoa. this. 
I am. I am absolutely delighted with the fit of the shirt. It's extremely comfortable, as you'd expect. And the pants, well, they are probably the most comfortable pants I own. They don't crease, they've got a bit of stretch, and they feel just like the t-shirts do, nice and soft. So if you're interested in upgrading your man to something a little bit fancy, click on the link below, scan the barcode right here. By clicking on the link in the description below or scanning the QR code right here, you're gonna go through to the True Classic website. And remember, by clicking on that link, by scanning that QR code, you are helping support our family and you might just find something very, very nice to purchase for yourself. That is 100% my new favorite outfit, my darling. Thank you very much. Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Oh, hang on a minute. You might want to take that off. <laughs> Good morning, folks. Gosh, yesterday was a day. What I have been dreading happening since we moved to Portugal happened, which was that one of us got hurt. I am so rubbish in those situations. I basically default to immediate panic. Immediate, it's absolute worst case scenario. <laughs> I literally thought John was bleeding to death, even though I couldn't see a single drop of blood because as he sliced his hand, he pinched it together and managed to actually stem any flow of blood whatsoever. So. There was no need for such drama in my um, in my head. This morning, things are a bit brighter. John's feeling all right. Um, he's going to rest up a little bit. Yeah, and he's got six stitches in his hand. But we were so impressed by the hospital staff and how quickly he was seen. Literally, we walked straight in. We didn't even wait for two minutes. Um, sat down, got cleaned up, stitched, saw the doctor, and we were out of there within 20 minutes, I think, of arriving. Um, and that is just at the public health service here in our local town, which... I don't know, you know, like we said, if it was in the UK, we would have waited for hours. So for that, we are extremely grateful and we're very, very lucky. But it had us thinking about kind of, you know, what can happen in this kind of environment. This morning, I'm going to do a little bit of a fun bit of work up here at the veggie garden. So many of you sent to me on Instagram an idea to make a sweet pea teepee. Um, which I think is just genius. I've been growing some sweet pea seedlings in the veggie, uh, in the greenhouse, sorry. And behind me here are a row of peas which need a new home because I haven't trellised them and they're so patchy, it just seems like a bit silly. So anyway, I thought what I might do is take some of them out and put them around my teepee, my pea teepee, um, and that would probably work a little bit better. So that's my plan for today. And it's part of what I love about this life is that we can come out and do projects like this and just kind of experiment with different things and have a whole lot of fun building a dream life for us and our kids. <laughs> right, well, one of the challenges I have up here is there is actually quite a lot of shade um, in, in and around the vegetable patch, but I really love trees and I hate cutting them down. So I don't want to cut any more down, but I think as we kind of get a bit more settled, we're going to have to thin things out a little bit. Anyway, I think this is the best spot for it. I'm going to do it sort of here. And my idea is that the boys will have somewhere really fun to come and sit in while I'm here working in the vegetable garden. So I'm going to clear this out, dig a round trench. I've got some bamboo canes. I'm going to cut them all to the same size, make a teepee, wrap some string around it, and then plant pea seedlings and sweet peas in, an, in, in the, the circle and hopefully by July, August time, we'll have a beautiful pea tent. Looking back now, I can see how unprepared and unaware I was of what lay ahead for us when we made this move to Portugal. Since we began restoring this farm, we've learned countless new skills. Carpentry, masonry, building, farming, gardening, plumbing, sort of, and not nearly enough Portuguese. Moving to a new country has given us opportunities I didn't even know existed, and there's still so much more to come. So obviously, not all abandoned land is created equal. And when I look at these bamboo canes, I think about what we've kind of managed to achieve since we got here. This property had been abandoned for over 20 years, and actually, later today, we have one of our neighbours coming to see us who lived here as a little boy, and he's going to tell us what it was like when he was here, and I'm so excited to hear from him. Um, and we'll let you know what he says. But when we arrived, this place was basically choked by bamboo. We even had to get a digger in to come and lift the root beds. And I think without that, we would still be really fighting it. And we are still fighting it, but it's definitely under control. But anyway, the canes have come super handy. Um, and these we used last year for our tomatoes, and I'm just gonna repurpose them 
into my pea tent this year. If you're wanting to look into buying some abandoned land in Portugal, you've really got to kind of go in with your eyes wide open um, and look at what you're actually taking on. You know, we didn't even think about the fact that we were taking on a forest of bamboo and what that would mean in terms of being able to get rid of it. Um, we didn't really look at, I don't know, we just kind of, we loved the look of the property and we went with our guts, but you know, that kind of, it has thrown up quite a few of those sorts of things which we just hadn't considered before we got here. So the state of your land, really important to think about. Right, let's go and get these into the room. taking me a lot longer than I thought it was going to but anyway I've managed to get loads of peas out of the line and onto the teepee they all look a bit weepy and sad but I'm hoping they'll poke up after a while it's really not the best time to have moved them in the heat of the day but anyway um, it is the time I've got so we have to just crack on um, the next thing I've got to do um, is give them all a lot of water and just get the sweet peas out so I'm just going to do the sweet peas first and then Give them all a good water and put the chickens back in the coop because they're already trying to eat them. Right, water. Oh my gosh. Plumbing. A constant drama on this farm. Basically, there's an issue with electrics that's tripping the pump that pumps water up here. And it is very irritating, but our plumbing disasters are numerous and they are pretty complex. So best thing to do is rewind when we discovered our latest plumbing disaster, which is in the stone house, of course. I've got bad news. What's that? I just took that out of the post box. What's that? €129.61. What's that, for one month? Yep. Wow, that's outrageous. <laughs> that's the second time we've had a bill, a water bill, for well over €100 Euros for one month. I checked with Joao, um, last time this happened and he said normally a water bill in portugal is 30 euros we are literally using a washing machine and then we have a shower and a dishwasher that's it um yeah. so i think we've got some problems with our plumbing who remembers um when was it just before christmas mm. when the when i heard the water coming out from under the ground well that's why we thought the last one was so high because we had a leak under the courtyard and we yeah. thought well it must be because of that big leak but yeah. we fixed it so to get that it has to be this house i think it's this house i think we're pouring mains water into the walls i think we are let's go and have a look inside that, that, this is good news for two reasons number one we get to show you around inside this house which is part of the project that we're working on right now and a giant mess and a giant mess but we're going to be renovating it in its entirety so we can talk you through that Let's have a look at the water damage in there um, and then I'm going to try and fix it myself. Um, and switch that off before it bankrupts yeah, us. Yeah, I'm going to switch the water off right now. We haven't been in here a couple of weeks, but come and have a look at this stuff. Okay. P.S. everybody, this kitchen here, we're going to rip it out and when we knock down the other house, we're going to put the, the kitchen that I built ages ago, um, we're going to put it in here, we're going to keep those tiles and we're gonna paint that kitchen that I built myself blue or a bluey color so it kind of fits in this area here. Um, but this will stay as a kitchen. Yeah. All I can say is I'm so glad we're renovating. Ooh, look at it. Yes, that's, that's not good. Okay. There's so much mold in here. 
Okay. All right. Well, at least the roof isn't leaking. That's pretty good. But the walls are gnarly, hey? How are we going to get it so it stays? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah okay. So we've got a tiny bathroom here. This, yeah, this, um, I keep like in, in, in the depths of the night when I can't sleep. It's always keeping me awake. Keep trying to imagine how we can make that bathroom bigger. I don't know that we can, but no, but it looks it's super damp all up here as well. So lots to do. This was our original room that we stayed in originally for when we first got here, wasn't it? <laughs> I remember you fixing a tiny patch of damp up there. Do you remember? Yeah. The yeah. chimney was leaking. It seemed like such a minor problem. We did also have a leaking wall there before, which the plumber said he fixed. Um, yeah, yeah. which he did. I think he fixed the one end of it where it's no longer leaking, but we didn't realise the entire edge here is leaking. Yeah. I'm so, I think like, you know, if we're going to take out this bathroom, which I think we are, aren't we? Well, and I, lift these tiles off, this whole wall's just going to crumble, isn't it? It's just wet. It probably will. So what we'll do is if we switch off the um, water to this house entirety, the biggest thing I think the issue is, sorry, just with the water switching off. So when we changed from mains, changed over to mains water, the change in pressure was immense. We went from having like just three bar uh, pressure to mm. it literally Six like bar. hurts your hand when it comes out the tap. Yeah. And this is the challenge of buying an abandoned property that hasn't been lived in for 20 years. And perhaps some, you know, other people would have done it differently and, and gutted it and done all that. But we didn't have the resources to be able to do that. We needed to be able to move in and fix as we went. So now we're in a situation where we've plugged a new mains water into very, very old plumbing. And obviously everything's exploding because everything's popped. You know, we had the pop, the, the pipe that burst in the courtyard. This obviously has burst in here, old pipes in here. Um, so it is what it is, not ideal, but that, that is one of the hazards of, of buying an abandoned property. If you need to move into it, you're asking really old systems um, to keep up with quite modern pressures. <laughs> Plumbing, love. You love that. <laughs> so I'm off to do one of my most favourite things right now, which is plumb. Um, let's go to the knock garage, that's where it all begins. Okay. This is our travesty of a water system. Um, currently, I don't know whether you can see it, you might be able to, I'm not sure. Currently, we've got a pipe that comes in here and just on the other side of me, and then it goes off in this direction. And that's the pipe, I think, I don't know yet. I think this pipe leads to the stone house. So I'm gonna chop this off and I'm gonna get rid of it for us, plumbing has been such a difficult thing to negotiate. Um, it's been very hard. So one of the things that we, we didn't think about when we purchased the property um, two years ago now was where is the water going to come from and how much does it cost to get connected to mains waters and even electricity if you needed to do that. I'm just going to turn the mains water off now, but one of the things that we didn't really consider because the first time we bought a, a property like this in a foreign country was services. Now we've got really, really lucky here. Um, as it turns out, we had electricity already connected to the property. We hadn't really considered that, um, you know, because we were thinking, oh, we'll go off grid, we'll go with solar. Solar is a really great thing during the summertime, but here in northern Portugal during the wintertime, forget about it. It's just not going to work. So you would need to find an alternative solution if you weren't connected to mains, um, main, uh, to a main supply. On this property, we lucked out. We've got a well already dug um, that produces quite a lot of water, and we've also got a spring. But September, October, both of them run out of water pretty much which basically means if we weren't connected to the mains water, and this, is, this has been part of our, our story, part of our history, last year we actually ran out of water. Um, no, the year before we actually ran out of water because we weren't connected to the mains water. You know, services right up there, that's a fibre broadband cable. We've got fibre broadband on this property. It's amazing. Who would have thought? Um, and it didn't cost, it cost us 60 euros to get connected to fibre. 
um, because it was in the local area. It was very close and it was very easy to put together. Um, and I would say, you know, think about those services before you buy a property. Where is your property located and how close to those services are your, is your property? Anyway, let's get on. Let's turn off the water down here. Ooh, that's mains water off. Um, and let's go and see if we can <laughs> cause some damage to my plumber, <laughs> to my pipes. I'm really, I, I'm nervous about this because we getting a plumber um, to come and work on these old, old buildings is really difficult. Let's see if we can, let's twist it, that's nice. There we go. That's out. Now if I open a tap inside, that should all... That's it. Let's see how, how we go. Oh, blimey. That could have just been such an easy job if it's done like that. And then look at the walls, even on the outside of this house, it's crumbling because it's so wet. We've had some fairly tricky news um, come in first thing this morning from our architect, Eduardo. Sadly, our first round of application and planning permission has been rejected. Yeah. So here's the scoop and here's the lowdown. In order to get planning permission in Portugal for us, it might be different for other people, but for us, we need to go through two different processes. Or two different departments. Two different departments. The first department is the department that rules the land around here. And the second department is the local mu municipality. Now, it's the first department that we are stumbling at. So that first department is the agricultural reserve and they basically govern the agricultural parts of rural Portugal and make sure that certain percentages of the land that you own remain dedicated to agriculture and don't just get kind of converted into houses or um, urban land or, you know, made not agricultural. The issue is the amount of cement surface or non-permeable surface that we are allowed or they're suggesting that we should be able to build here. Yeah, which is all relative to the size of your property. So depending on how big your property is, determines how much impermeable area you can have. Absolutely. So we've got a couple of options there. We could go ahead and buy a whole bunch of, of new land around here. It's fairly reasonably priced and we're actually currently trying really, really hard to buy some land, another three fields right next to us, which would give us a lot of breathing space in terms of building permits. Mm -hmm. The second thing we could do is reduce the amount of square meters. And in our instance, it's 300, a footprint, a footprint of 300 square meters of impermeable land. So that includes this, what we're standing on at the moment, which is a courtyard. It includes our knock garage. It includes our stone house. It includes our uh, derelict house and it includes the, the, the house to the right here, the house we're living in currently. It also includes a tiny house, anything basically that water can't get through. So, the, yeah. the, the issue really mainly is that we have this courtyard and, yeah. and that that is accounting for a significant portion of impermeable space. Mm. So we're kind of... We don't want to get rid of the courtyard, no, it's beautiful. The courtyard is the one part of this property that feels like a historic feature, a historic feature that should be preserved and looked after. Almost, you would say, there is so little value except for the location of this property in these particular buildings mm. that, the, that to get rid of the courtyard, which is an extremely special feature, would feel like, um, like not doing right about this property. Mm. Ultimately, this courtyard will be the central point, the focal point of the entire build if we get a permit. Yeah. Well, we've gone back yeah. with a kind of counter proposal, Yeah. which is that we take down the knock garage and we relieve that space of being impermeable. Yeah. So we can try and keep the courtyard, keep the footprint that we're planning and keep the stone house and the tiny house, but kind of give us a bit more 
get, get us back beneath the 300 square meters of impermeable space. Oh, treasure. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, <laughs> so Great. basically, we are, we've got to knock down the, the knock garage. That's it and all about it. Um, and hopefully, in doing that, they're going to say, OK, you get your permits. But what's happened now is we are back to square one. Um, we've submitted our application. It's been rejected. We are resubmitting with a different proposal um, and we will wait. We wait some more. So we'll keep you posted. But we have promised that we will let you know and keep you updated with all of the ups and downs for this process. Um, so that's what we know so far. Here's my take on it, though, guys. And this video is a lot to do with um, the setbacks and the drawbacks of, of, of you know, trying to buy a property and renovate a property in Portugal. You've got another option. You could go ahead and do it without the permits. A lot of people do. Um, you would then risk uh, the possibility of legislation changing in the future. Um, there are houses not so far away from here that have gone ahead and done that, um, spent hundreds of thousands of euros and had their property knocked down um, because the land people, the agricultural, agricultural reserve, reserve, has basically said, nah, -uh, not taking it, not having it. Those guys really mean business. The municipality will give you a slap on the wrist and make you pay a fine. But those agricultural guys, you don't want to mess with them. Yeah. So if you are thinking about buying a property in Portugal, it's really worth considering the location you buy it in. Is it agricultural? Is it rural? Is it um, urban. urban? Or um, is it and, and does it have the correct permits associated with the property that you're buying? Think about it. Important. Yeah, it is really important.